Hey, thanks for clicking play on Growing in the Gospel. You've clicked into our study of the Gospel of John, Jesus Up Close. And today we are in John chapter 10. The title of the message is Good Jesus. This is part 30 of our study. So if you'd like to hear and track along with the entire study, go to the channel and click on the playlist, Jesus Up Close, the Gospel of John. But for now, let's open our hearts. Today we're going to discover how we subconsciously sometimes put Jesus back on trial. How can we end that cycle of requiring Jesus to prove himself over and over and over and over again? Why not just render a verdict and then trust Jesus all the way for the rest of the way? Why not just let him be good uh, because he is? So I think today is going to equip you and encourage you. Let's press into John chapter 10, good Jesus. I'll see you at the end of the message. Journey with us verse by verse through John's gospel. Okay, two weeks ago, I introduced you to a sheep named Chris. You guys remember Chris? Okay, and after church, a lot of you were really upset with me. Well, okay. I just said, cut me some slack. So I, I, you know, the rest of the story was irrelevant to my illustration, so I didn't even think about you guys wanting to know the rest of the story until after church. And then it was like great anger descending upon me in the lobby. What happened to Chris? Show us a picture of Chris. Okay, so, well, let me catch everybody up if you weren't here two weeks ago. Chris is a sheep that was a sheep that lived in Australia. He was about 2000, I guess 10 or 11. He wandered away from his shepherd and his fold and his, his flock and friends. He just said, I'm done with all of you. I quit. Sick of this good care. And... These, these, um, he just, he kind of like Christians, he, he just lost his patience with his church family and he left. And he, and he ended up wandering in a preserve for five years alone. No shepherd, no care, obviously no shearing. And he ended up the size of a small car. He couldn't even walk, he couldn't go to the bathroom. He, he was about to die, frankly, he would not have lived much longer. A, a hiker found him, saw him, called Animal Rescue. They came out and got Chris. And they uh, hired a special shearer to come in, professional guy, and this is what they removed from Chris. It's a world record of how much wool this lamb was carrying. Because sheep are not designed to carry this, they're not designed to go without care and shepherding, just like you are not designed to go that way. So here is before and after of Chris, okay? He looks good, doesn't he? It's, it's like, you know, it's coming back to the sheepfold, getting back around his sheep friends, getting back to his shepherd, letting him shear him a little bit, carrying a little less weight. He just, I think he cleaned up really well. Um, now, Chris passed away a couple years ago. I don't know, it's kind of sad, but um, he lived a good old age life. He lived to a long old age for sheep, uh, that is. Um, and so these, these are shots of Chris after he was taken to this rescue center where he then commenced to live out the rest of his days in care and joy and happiness and provision and safety. And Chris never really had much of a desire to wander off again. It's amazing how that works. Um, so there it is. Are you, do you feel better? Okay, do you forgive me now? Thank you. Man, okay. So as we come to John 10, this beautiful illustration is what Jesus is using to teach us about himself and who he is and who we are to him. And the fact he's trying to establish is that a shepherdless life is truly a miserable life. Most people around you don't have a shepherd and it's no wonder they're so miserable. They've got a curse because life stinks it's why every other word is an F word. Life stinks without a shepherd. And it doesn't promise to get any better. It's just a grave at the end of it. Life without a shepherd is terrible. We all need a shepherd. We all long for shepherding. Listen, there's a kid in every one of us. There's not, not an adult in this room that doesn't have a little boy or a little girl still living inside of you that, that doesn't wake up every day wishing you had a forever father 
who was perfectly promising to take care of you and guide you and lead you and make sense out of everything you go through and promising to get you through and to get you safely home and to care for you. Every one of us, like children, long for that same kind of care. We long for that ongoing sense of safety as the world comes on down around us, whether it's a pandemic or a recession or anything else, when things that we tie off to become unstable, we're, oh no, now what am I gonna hold on to? We all need and long for that deep strength, that deep help, that deep care, kind of like Chris needed. So we're coming into a chapter where Jesus is offering us this kind of relationship with God through him. He is the door, he's the way into it, And he's the shepherd, he is the caregiver of every soul that is offered to him in faith and trust. Every single person that looks at all the options of religion and philosophy and ideologies and cults and every kind of explanation for things and weighs it all out and looks at it and comes to a verdict, comes to a decision that Jesus is the answer, he is the truth, he is the way, he is the life. Every soul that comes there, Jesus says, welcome home. You now have a shepherd, and you can now lose all the baggage. You can now be healed and recovered from your wandering in the wilderness, and you can now be a member of my fold and my family, and you can be my sheep. And what we're reading here is a very intimate, relational, experiential passage of Jesus offering himself, but he's offering himself to very stubborn, argumentative, unbelieving people at least some of them. And what we're gonna see today is what we've seen really the last five or six chapters in a row, it's just a recurring sequence of events. It is doubtful, skeptical, scornful, murderous, unbelieving people putting Jesus back on trial again. Over and over and over we've seen this. The trial never ends, no matter what Jesus does, They never land in belief. And the reason I think this is so significant for us today is that wherever you are on the journey, everybody in this room has the same struggle with doubt and unbelief, if only at times. We all experience the tendency, at least I know I do, and I'm preaching to myself as much as anyone else today, we tend, about the time I want to get real critical of the religious leaders who, in the face of undeniable and controvertible evidence, still said, prove it, over and over and over again, I'm like, well, wait a minute, I kind of do that too. I have now personally 45 years, from the time I was eight years old to now 53, of walking with Jesus imperfectly, limping, you know, Trudging forward, spiritually speaking. And I have a very short memory because I got 45 years of stories of how God came through and how he rescued me from different situations and healed me and and paid my bills and sustained me through complex situations and seasons and grief and sorrow and loss and hardship and heaviness and burdens and questions and confusion and disorientation. I mean, time and time and time, not dozens, hundreds of situations that I could tell you where God came through and proved himself and validated his presence and his activity in my life beyond question. But I'll turn around from that story and wake up tomorrow with a new challenge And I'll say, well, God, why are you doing this to me? And how are you gonna do this? Prove it again. And I go right back to my doubt and right back to my questions, and it's like I put Jesus right back on the the stand to prove himself, and I don't mean that in a good way. I mean that like he's on trial. Let me ask you this. What happens in any relationship where the other person is perpetually on trial? Suffice to say, you're definitely bringing the relationship to a standstill because you're stunting development that should grow out of trust and love and mutual respect. And in any relationship that you say, I don't trust you, what are you up to, what are you doing, what's really going on here, you do that to your spouse, you're going to have a pretty weak marriage. If that's in perpetuity, what happened? I'm not saying, we all go through seasons where there's questions and trials and hardships. 
But eventually, any healthy relationship has got to get back to, I trust you. I'm, I'm going to rest in that trust. I'm going to stop making you be retried on the courtroom, on the witness stand of my life every single day. If that's your state of relationships, they aren't really relationships. They're, they're weak, they're fragmented, they're, they're frustrating. It's never going to go anywhere. And such is the case with your relationship with Jesus. At some point, we have to grow to the point where he doesn't need to be on, the tri on trial in our lives anymore. It's like, okay, you're good, you're God, I trust you. Now, as soon as I say that, that's where I want to be, that's where as I've studied this message out, it's compelled me and convicted me, but I have the decision again tomorrow. And my aim, my goal is, God, help me stop forcing you to be tried again in the courtroom of my doubt. Help me to get to a place where my instinctive response is, he's God and I trust him. Now, with all that set up, I just want to suggest to you today that as we study this chapter, you would bring an end to what I call the strange ongoing retrial of Jesus. That you would decide to walk forward in a different depth and in a different kind of relationship because when you finally do, your experience of the relationship with Jesus, your shepherd, will change. Just like if me and Dana are every morning, what are you up to, what are you doing, where are you going, who are you with, what were you saying? And every time it's distrust, we're just stunting the growth of our marriage. But once we finally say, I believe you, I trust you, and I'm gonna grow, all of a sudden the relationship can flourish. All of a sudden we're setting it free. If you'll respond to this the way that Jesus would want you to today, you'll be setting your heart free in relationship with him. And you'll kind of be like Chris. Okay, so you ready to dive into scripture? You guys okay? All right. So first thought I want you to write down is, the burden of proof is already met. Number one reason you don't need to put Jesus on trial. In the case of your relationship with him, the burden of proof is already met. That means even if you've yet to trust him as savior, or maybe you trusted him as your savior 10 or 20 years ago or last week, the point I want that Jesus is gonna make here is that the burden of proof is already met. So let's pick it up in verse 22. Now before we read 22, I do need to give you the context and remind you where we are. Chapters eight and nine, Jesus has come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. He came in the middle of the week, stood up and said, I'm the light of the world. Stood up at the, uh, no, uh, no, he said, I'm the water. I'm, I'm, I'm water of life, I'm living water. At the end of the week, at the end of the feast, he said, I'm the light of the world. As the feast ended, Lots of debate and argumentation. They're gonna kill him because he keeps claiming to be God. He escapes. He walks out of the temple in Jerusalem, sees a blind man, heals him. That unfolds into a long chapter of debate again, back and forth. The blind man is saved. Uh, the critics critique. Uh, the judges try and uh, they still wanna kill Jesus. Jesus then goes into chapter 10 with the passage about being the good shepherd. And then we ended our last study at verse 21. The people were divided in their opinions. Some believed, some didn't believe. Now what you need to know is, between verse 21 and 22, just bracket a little line, maybe in your Bible, and write two months. Two months have gone by between verse 21 and 22. Jesus left Jerusalem, Feast of Tabernacles, that's in the fall, that's in like October. So verse 22 picks up the story, and it was at Jerusalem, the feast of, what's the word? Dedication, and it was what? Winter. So now it's two months later. Feast of Tabernacles is in October. Dedication feast is in December. I think it's kind of cool, and I did not plan this, how our study has followed our own calendar chronologically. We studied chapters eight and nine all through the fall, um, and now we're coming into winter soon, and G it's winter for Jesus. You need to know this is about three months before his crucifixion. 
John's gospel, the first half of John's gospel, and we're coming to the, to the middle of the book right here, it's 21 chapters. The first half is all the, 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 first, uh, all the first two and a half years or more of Jesus' life. The last half is one week. So John zooms in to one, the last week in the life of Jesus. We're not there yet, but we're about three months out from his crucifixion. So chronologically, the story is coming to its end. That's why Jesus is getting um, more serious in his public confrontation and more declarative, stating the case one more time so that those who desire will believe. Okay, so it was winter, Feast of the Dedication. What is the Feast of Dedication? It's what we know as Hanukkah. How many of you are familiar with that word, Hanukkah, okay? So Hanukkah is not a Bible feast. It's, you won't find it in the Bible. But the time between the Old and the New Testaments, and I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but the temple was sieged and taken over and desecrated. And it was kind of, um, the, the worship froze in the nation for some time. And then it was, re, um, it was reclaimed, and the Jews reconstituted their worship in the temple grounds, and so they rededicated the temple. And that time happened um, at this time of year, and they called that the Feast of Dedication. They made it a national time of, of commemoration and celebration that still they practice today called Hanukkah. It's, it stands, it means a, a feast of lights, and they celebrate it by lighting lights over eight days. And it's still a, a special time, but it had to do with reopening worship in the temple. So Jesus has come to back to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. Um, so verse 23, the things start to heat up really quickly. Jesus walked into the temple, uh, in the temple in Solomon's porch. It's these porticos in the temple grounds. Then came the Jews round about him. Everywhere he goes, he attracts a crowd, but these guys want him dead. They've been waiting for a time to kill him, but now it's a public setting, and so they're very, they're very careful. Uh, they they want to they wanna take him out in a strategic way. They don't, don't want to create an uprising or political complexity. So they came around about him and they said unto him, now look at what they asked Jesus. Very interesting. How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not. Now look back at their question. How long do you make us to doubt? Now, now catch this. They're not only doubting him, they're not only retrying him, now they're blaming him for their doubt. Now, now they're blame shifting. They're saying, not only do we not believe you, but it's your fault we don't believe. If you would just show us, if you would just tell us plainly, if you would just prove it, maybe you wouldn't be making us doubt. And again, before I get too critical of them, I'm kind of the same way. How many times have I said, how many times have you said, God, why are you doing this to me? Again, blame. God, I'm struggling. I'm struggling to believe you. I'm struggling to trust you. I'm struggling to surrender to you, and it's your fault. If you would just make it easier for me, I would. This is what we do. Here's the thing, and it's true of them, it's true of us. Jesus said it. First of all, look at the phrase, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, talk to me, church. Help me out. Has Jesus told them plainly? Yeah, you're like, pastor, it's like insanity how plainly this has been through all these chapters. Galilee and Jerusalem, the whole nation, thousands and thousands of people have heard over and over and over again. And John said in the gospel, that the, he's just giving us little vignettes and little snippets and little snapshots of all the good things Jesus did. John says, all the books in the world could not contain all the good things and all the miracles and all the supernatural acts that Jesus did. Now I want you to play this out. Uh, the Old Testament prophet said, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. And he wasn't kidding. A great light to the tune of not a few miracles, not a couple dozen healings, not, not even hundreds. We're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of miracles and supernatural interventions and literally like manufacturing of health and limbs and organs and, and I mean, off the chart supernaturality, off the chart divine intervention of God on planet Earth 
Uh, okay, let's bring it to the 21st century. Let's imagine that God visited, put on a human body and visited Hartford tomorrow. And he was here. And the way we know he's here is he tells us he's God, but then he starts across the state and by midnight tomorrow night, there's not one sick person left in the entire state. Would you believe? Like every hospital's empty, every doctor's out of business, every nursing facility's empty, everybody got up and walked out, everybody, every cough is gone, every learning disability, all the blind people can see, all the deaf people can hear, all the lame people can walk, everybody is healed, and there's no need for medical care in, in Connecticut anymore. That has been their experience. Like, we could only just, oh, that would be amazing. But they're like, hmm, still not sure. But again, as soon as I want to laugh at them, I'm like, here, I got my 45 years worth of, of, of track record of Jesus proving himself to me, and tomorrow I got a little problem, and I go, oh, well, this is probably one that's going to break you, God. Pretty sure. Pretty sure it's all over right here. And I put him right back on trial. What Jesus is saying, he says, I told you and you believe not. What he's saying is, the burden of proof is already met. What that means is, the problem in the hearts of these people was not that Jesus was unbelievable. The problem was that their hearts were filled with willful unbelief. This is what I want you to confront yourself with. How often, even though I'm believing for my salvation, how often is my heart set back into willful disbelief or willful doubt? When in reality, the burden of proof has been established and my new questioning, my new doubting of Jesus is really not rational, it's emotional. It's really not objective because the burden of proof is met. And so I'm just forcing him back onto the witness stand. Let me tell you why we do that, okay? Because we are uncomfortable with what the implications of belief are. We choose willful unbelief because we fear the cost of belief. We fear the risk of belief. If I believe truly, then I, then I would do that, and that's scary, that's risky, That. Oh, I'm not sure I can do that, so I'll just step back here and, and doubt and blame God for not giving me enough information. And Jesus says to them and to me and to you, you have all the information you need to know I'm faithful, to know I'm good. You just need to look in the mirror and be honest with yourself that you're putting me back on trial because of the implications of belief. That's big. You guys okay? I thought I believed, but wow, Pastor Kerry, you're, you're telling me that maybe I still struggle. Now, I'm not talking about in terms of salvation. I'm just talking about in, your, in the growth of your everyday relationship. If you're, if you're there often, you're stunting. You're halting the experience. You're, you're telling the shepherd every day, Prove to me that I'm a sheep. Prove to me that you're good. Prove to me that you're a shepherd. And you're just as frantic as if you had still been lost. And, 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 and if you take him off the, the trial, if you'd call an end, if you'd bring a verdict and, and rest in your verdict, you could be like Chris. And you could live out your life in peace and safety and care and provision. So the burden of proof is already met, which means unbelief and doubt is my problem, not his. Second thought, quickly, the verdict on Jesus is personal and relational. And I just love this. Now, hang with me in the next few minutes. Uh, we're going to go relational first, and then we're going to get a little theological, okay? But I want you to see the beauty of the passage before we wrestle with the complexity of the passage. I want you to wrestle and, and really soak in the simplicity of this. Okay. Um, so we pick it up at the end of verse 25. Jesus says, I told you you believe not. 
and the works that I do, remember all these vast multitude of good works, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So in simple terms, I am sent of the Father, I am the Father. In a few minutes he's gonna say, I am my Father or one, categorical claim of, of being that he is God, that he is deity wrapped in humanity. Um, so he's saying, I am God, come from God the Father to do so many good works and to teach so many profound truths that the evidence is clear, okay, and incontrovertible. God has provided sufficient witness to his heart, his love, his character, and trustworthiness. Verse 26, but you believe not. I want you to just make a mental note of the personal responsibility he's putting on them. He's not saying, I do not permit you to believe. He's not saying, I predetermined your belief. He's saying, you believe not. You made the choice, okay? But then what he says, look at this, but you believe not because, or for which cause, you're not my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now again, I said theology next, but beauty first. I want you to imagine yourself as Chris, and imagine yourself lost in the wilderness of a nature preserve for five years while you're growing and dying. And while there is no care, and there is no purpose, and there is no meaning, and there is no uh, love and provision and safety and security, and you're vulnerable. How he survived five years, I can't even fathom. But Jesus steps in and says, look, I'm the good shepherd, and I love you so much, I'm gonna give my life for you. And when you come through me, through my door, into my sheepfold, you're gonna learn me, and I'm gonna be with you, and I'm gonna care for you, and you're gonna know my voice. Think of the intimacy of this. Think of the experientiality of this. Think of Chris in the wilderness not knowing any care or any voice of any human beings. And then think of him being brought into that animal rescue center and, and knowing the touch and the provision and the care of his caregivers and learning that voice and learning that environment and letting that rest him, letting that calm him letting that soothe him and care for him, and that's how he lived out his days. And Jesus is saying, my sheep have that relationship with me. My sheep know me and I know them, and it's close, and it's relational, and it's experiential, and they follow me. Now, in this, let's, let's switch channels now, let's talk theology for, for about five minutes, okay? And I'm gonna take great complexity and try to make it very simple. Implied in this passage and others in the Bible is a confusing intersection. And on one side, I would call it free will, choice, choose to believe or not. And on the other side of the equation, just kind of let this space kind of, kind of fill in for you, free will on this side. And on this side, you have foreknowledge, the idea that God knows who's going to believe, who's going to be saved. And the reason I say this is a confusing intersection is because it's, it's really hard for our human brains, in fact, it's impossible for our human brains to reconcile these two very scriptural and very biblical realities. And it, it, to make it simple, it's like, do I have the choice and, the, and to exercise will to believe in Jesus, or did God in his foreknowledge predetermine the choice before I came into being? Which is it? Because in our human minds, it can't be both, okay? Now, you say, Pastor, are you gonna explain this and, and, and reconcile it? No, because <laughs> that would be stupid, because nobody can. And the biggest thing I wanna tell you about this as your pastor and friend is anybody tells you they understand the intersection of free will and foreknowledge, run for your life because that is a level of arrogance that borders on stupidity. Only an infinite mind understands where these two friendly realities intersect in the heart and mind of God. 
But I think I can give you an illustration that at least gives you peace with it, with the fact that it can coexist without any conflict, okay? And let me warn you of the dangers of both, of the ditches on both sides of the equation, okay? In extreme forms, and you'll, as you grow and as you read and as you hear teachers on the radio or television or read books or whatever, you'll sometimes hear and, and, and learn from those that gravitate towards the foreknowledge. They, they call themselves sometimes Calvinists or hyper-Calvinists, the, the extreme version, um, or the other extreme of, of radical free will. And you'll, you'll come across different arguments or different ways of viewing these things. In the end of the day, it's kind of a pointless diversionary conversation. Okay, because our commission is not to figure out all of God's infinite theological angles. It's really to just get the message of the gospel to the lost world. Okay, that's our commission. And one day in heaven, you know, if we don't do that work, God's going to say, why would you sit around arguing about things you couldn't even think about anyway and not doing what I said to do? Okay, it's like you telling your kids to pick up their room and then they sit down and they begin to dissect the molecular construct of the carpet. And you come in a day later and the room is still messy and you're like, why didn't you do what I said? Well, we're trying to figure out the construct of the carpet. You get it? Okay, so that's why I only wanna spend a few minutes on this. But the dangers are this. If you go hard to the foreknowledge, predetermined crowd, you end up with a God who makes the decision for everybody and nobody really does have a choice. And then you end up with, with a Jesus who only died for some and not all, and the Bible says all, and who only loves some and not all, and you end up with, um, with a God who created some people to burn in hell forever, but that same God says he loves the whole world. So you end up with real biblical problems if you go hard that way, but you end up with equally real uh, problems if you go hard too far the other way, because the other way is to say it's all on you and your choice, and God doesn't really save you, you save you. And God's just up in his heaven biting his nails to see, is anybody going to believe? Oh, no. You know, and it's not that either. The fact of the matter is the Bible does teach that every individual has a choice to make when it comes to Jesus, and God holds us responsible for that choice, accepting or rejecting him. And it does teach us that God knows who's going to make that choice. So let me give you the illustration that, to me, that marries the two. I've been married for 32 years to my best friend. So 32 years ago, I would tell you, I chose Dana to be my bride. And you, and you, you get this image of like me walking through a mall and I see her and I go, you, me, now. <laughs> it's destined, you're my wife, I declare it, get over here. Is that a marriage? No. It, but it makes sense to you when I say I chose Dana to be my bride. That in no way implies that I overruled her choice and forced her, does it? No, because you automatically kind of intuitively understand, well, Dana also chose and it's, we don't question it. Well, who choose, who chose who? Can't be both, pastor. No, it has to be both. If it's not both, we don't have a marriage. We've got a slavery. If I said, you're my bride now, you have no choice in the matter, she's enslaved to me. If she says, you're my, I mean, it takes both. I chose her, she chose me. And it works. And we don't even question it. So let me just put you at ease and comfort you. When the Bible says, Jesus chose you and you choose him, here's, here's what Jesus is saying. Nobody is excluded. Everybody that chooses me, I choose. Everybody I choose chooses me. And everybody can come into this heart of love. Nobody will make the choice and be rejected. Like if Dana said, I choose you to be my husband, i say, no. <laughs> Jesus is saying, no, I choose everybody that chooses me. And the duality of the choice, as in marriage, is no conflict to us. It needs to peacefully exist in our mind and give you great assurance that, yes, as you chose him, he chose you. 
And this relationship is beautiful and it's wonderful because of the mutuality of that love. We love him because he first loved us. He was the prime mover. He was the one who took the first step. That's all over scripture. But I just want you to be at rest and be careful as you're growing and studying that you don't go hard to either edge. There's a ditch in both sides of the road. Got it? You good? Can we, can we move on? Okay. Um, number three, and this is quick. Establishing your verdict opens up or unfolds goodness. So we started with the idea of the message that Jesus is good. They can't see it. They have seen it. They refuse to see it, okay? So you've heard me say, show me and I'll believe. You've heard the, you know, that, that people say, show me and I'll believe, but God says, believe me and I'll show you, okay? That's how faith works. But in this case, the world is saying to Jesus, show me and I'll believe, and Jesus is saying, I already have shown you. <laughs> so now believe me with the information you have, and I'll show you much more. So let's keep reading, and here Jesus is going to quantify now anyone who chooses him and believes him and, 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 and lives in that trust, what will they experience? He's going to give us three things, and I'm going to fold, unfold them on two levels. I give unto them, verse 28, I give unto them eternal life. That's the positive, and they shall never perish. That's the negative, a double reinforcement of the kind of life that invades your heart the minute Jesus comes into your life as Savior and the life you will never lose. So eternal life, number one. Then he continues, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Number two, eternal security. Absolute security. And I'll come back to that, okay? And I, I and my Father are one. We're one and the same, he's saying. And then the Jews took up stones to stone him again. Here we go again. We've already seen this scene. And Jesus answered them, and now Jesus has got a little snark to him, and I kind of like this. Many good works I have showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? I mean, that's, that's divine attitude right there. Okay, imagine that you spend a thousand bucks on your kids for Christmas, and Christmas morning rolls around and you uh, go get your kids from wherever you keep them. <laughs> the garage, the backyard, I don't know, wherever they live, uh, the basement, you know. And, and you bring your kids in to Christmas morning and their gifts are all there and, they, and, and you, you pray and you eat cinnamon rolls for breakfast like every good believer does on Christmas morning. And uh, followers of Jesus is just what we do. And then you say, let's open presents, kids. You're so excited for them to open their gifts. They open their gifts and, you know, they just go from one to the next. And there's wrapping paper everywhere and stacks of gifts everywhere. And, and you're so happy to see them happy. And, and then when it's all said and done, they, they grab the fireplace tools and they turn growling at you and now they're going to kill you. They're just viciously angry at you. And you look at your children and you say, well, I just gave you $1,000 worth of gifts. For which of these gifts do you kill me? And that's kind of the sense of it. He has lavished them with nothing but goodness. And, and because they want to be God, they want him out of the way. So, but, but Jesus is implying, listen, not just eternal life and eternal security, but eternal goodness. When you come into life with your shepherd, either as new birth or every day thereafter where you wake up and just live the life of a sheep, you're coming into three very important experiential realities. And I wanna list them in your outline for you, okay? When you come into this life, every time you express faith in Jesus. The first thing is you're living within the reality of your true identity in life, Zoe life. You're going to live forever if you know Jesus. So do you live out of that tomorrow? Or do you live tomorrow like you might die anytime? You know, like, are, are you, like it's all going to end. Are you living tomorrow for what's temporal or are you living tomorrow out of the idea that you're eternal and you're captive to eternal love? 
By the way, when Jesus said, no man can pluck them out of my hand, he, th- there's, this is no mixture of words. He absolutely, this is the strongest, one of the strongest passages in Scripture that teaches eternal security. What do we mean by that? Some of you have come from different backgrounds. Maybe you weren't taught this. Some, some have different opinions on this, like you can lose your salvation. Some believe you can't lose it, but you can give it back. These are all flawed fundamentally. They're flawed fundamentally on the basic premise of the gospel. What is it? The basic premise of the gospel is you do nothing to earn your salvation. Therefore, you can do nothing to keep your salvation. It is in no way performative. So if you ever go, well, I I really had a bad day yesterday. I wonder if I'm still saved. You're putting Jesus back on trial. He said, once you're saved, you're always saved. And no man can pluck you out of my hand. Listen, the burden of keeping you saved is Jesus, is on Jesus. Just like the burden of saving you in the first place. And my favorite quote on this um, is John MacArthur. He said, if you could lose your salvation, you already would have. Because just like you can't be good enough to be saved, you could never be good enough to stay saved. It just doesn't work that way, okay? So once you trust Christ, you can just rest. Oh, I'm never, I'm never afraid of judgment. I'm never afraid. Now, not, I'm not saying you, you don't reverence and, and appropriately fear accountability. That's different. Condemnation, never. Jesus was condemned for you. So eternal security, it's a wonderful thing. By the way, great book on that, if that's still a question in your mind. Well, what about this passage? There's a couple of passages that sound confusing. Charles Stanley wrote a book years ago called Eternal Security. He grew up in an environment where he wasn't taught that, but then later in his life when he really understood and, and studied it out, he realized, no, this is, this is a guaranteed thing. And I would, I would advise that book if that's confusing to you. Happy to talk about it. So you're living within the reality of your true identity. Number two, you're living within the buoyancy and durability of true security. True security. Jesus, when Jesus says, I'm yours forever, he means it. And believing it means you can be at rest. And you can live in that safely and securely. And thirdly, you live aligned with Jesus continuing good work to you and through you. You have been joined, you have been brought into a sheepfold that will never leave your soul wanting. You've been brought to a shepherd that will walk with you and never leave you forsaken. He will never leave you wandering. He is with you and he's got you and trusting him and walking with him is a joy and a delight. He is good ultimately always and forever. Now, I'm gonna pause there. Say, why are you gonna pause? Well, because I wanna be respectful of your time and I'm trying to shorten my messages um, and I've given you a lot to think about. The rest of this passage, and the other reason I wanna stop here is Jesus is gonna say something in the next verses. Some of you have already read ahead. It's like, what? And we'll talk about it next week. Um, But essentially, he's gonna say to these leaders, if you flawed, imperfect, corrupt, criminal-minded leaders could claim to represent God, why would you not believe a perfect, authoritative, supernatural visit to the planet from that same God? If you believe God could be represented in imperfect people, why wouldn't he visit the planet as a perfect savior? So my challenge to you today, is Jesus still on trial in your life? First part of that question is, has there been a moment of new birth, that moment when you said, Jesus, come into my life and save me, I want a shepherd, I wanna be your sheep. If not, then today, make that decision today. If you have made that decision, and many of you have, what about tomorrow and the next day? Do we not sometimes default to doubt, fear, faithlessness, distrust, and then don't we sometimes try to even blame God? Well, God, if you make it easier for me to believe, I would. And God says, no, the burden of proof is already established. The verdict, really, is very personal and experiential to you. It's an intimate thing of of trusting and resting in your shepherd. And when you render your verdict, and here's, as God, God challenged me this week, Carrie, here's my goal. I wanna wake up tomorrow, and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and on, 
And when I come into challenges and burdens and questions and things about life I don't understand or things that make me afraid or concern, more and more I want my instinctive response to be, I'm the, shep- I'm the sheep of a good shepherd and it's gonna be okay. Too often my instinctive response is, oh no, God, what are you gonna do now? This one's gonna break you, I know it is. You're gonna leave me. And I kind of panic. But I want my response to be, ah, my shepherd has got this and he's got me. And I invite you to ask God to help us all with that. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. What a great, great passage. What a great shepherd. What an amazing offer for a world of wandering sheep that you came to planet Earth, demonstrated beyond question your supernatural, infinite love, died on a cross, conquered death, and you offer to choose anyone who will choose you, and you have chosen anyone who will choose you, and we can come into this beautiful and wonderful shepherd-like relationship. God, help us to do it. With our heads bowed and eyes closed all around the room, I want to invite you, if you're a believer, to just talk with God in response. How is his spirit drawing? How is he convicting? How is he working in your life? And you respond to him right now. And then if you don't know that you have made the decision to invite Jesus into your heart and life as Savior, If you don't know, if you can't remember the moment of your new birth, when you said, Jesus, save me, come into my life and be my shepherd and I wanna be your sheep, then I wanna invite you right now to make that vital decision. There is no greater decision in all of your life because this brings you into the saved protection of God forever. So right where you are, if this is your heart, if you know you need a savior and you know you need forgiveness of your sin and guilt with God and you, you believe that Jesus is that shepherd and you wanna take him up on his offer, then right where you are, pray sincerely something like this. Jesus, I believe. I know I'm a sheep that has wandered. I know I'm lost. I know I've sinned and I'm guilty and I need forgiveness. And I believe you're the shepherd and the salvation of my soul. You died for me and rose again. And right now, I'm placing my faith and trust in you. Please come into my life and save me. Be my personal savior. Now all across the room, if that's your prayer, online, if that's your prayer, welcome to the family, welcome to the sheepfold. You've just made a wonderful decision. And I want to encourage you to do something simple. On the way out of the room, stop by the Next Step tables. We have a Bible and a book that we want to give you. It's just our way of saying thank you. Thank you and and congratulations, and we want to cheer you on. So come by and say, I prayed that prayer. I made that decision. I'd like that Bible, and we'll give it to you. If you're online, email me. We'll send it to you, pastor at ebcnewington.com. And right now, I want to pray for you. Jesus, thank you for this time. I pray you would help us this week to end the trial, to end the lifestyle of doubt, to end the lifestyle of second guessing, and to render a verdict. I pray that we'll just once and for all just land in the sheepfold and be at rest and trust that you are the good shepherd that you prove yourself to be. Give us a long memory of all the ways you have proven yourself before. And then give us immediate recollection in the face of the next trial or the next burden or the next question. Help us resist the the urge of our flesh to open court and put you back on the stand. And I pray that we will leave here encouraged and equipped to bless and honor you this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, when you end the trial of Jesus and when you receive him and trust him and rest in him, that ending of of putting him on trial brings you into a totally new kind of relationship where you can enjoy his goodness. 
You can know him personally. You enjoy a relationship with him. You trust him. You love him. And you walk forward with him. If you've never made that decision, I want to invite you to make it right now. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and life and to be your one and only Savior. Place your core trust, your faith in him. That is what the Bible calls salvation. If you have made that decision, then I encourage you to not be the kind of believer that keeps putting him back on trial, but instead rest in him, follow him, trust him, continue to trust him, continue to let your trust grow up in him. That's a great way to enjoy your relationship and to restfully delight in your Savior. So thanks for taking time to uh, partake in part 30 of our study of the Gospel of John. Again, all of this playlist is available under the Jesus Up Close uh, playlist on this channel. Many other Bible teachings on this channel. I hope you'll be blessed by them. Share the video, invite others to the study, and I'll see you in part 31.